Um, normally, what I talk about, though, is much more process-oriented. Um, because I, I deal with companies that are trying to understand how to use social media, um, we talk about measurements, like what is ROI, what is not ROI. So we'll talk about that in the, in the session later. Um, but we also talk about strategy and tactics and how to build programs and how to make them work. And typically, this is what I talk about. Today is a little bit different. Um, I was asked to uh, present on something completely different that I've never pre presented on before to a crowd. Usually, they're just conversations that I have with analysts or CEOs. Um, and it deals specifically with what's coming in the next decade, right? And it's, it's a little bit difficult because I, I can't guess, right? We don't know what's coming. Um, and with a lot of economic uncertainty and political uncertainty and a lot of upheaval, it's kind of difficult to, to create a nice, clear path of, uh, of what's going on. But we're going to try. So anyway, this is it. That's me. If you want to follow me on Twitter, hopefully I won't follow. There's a huge hole right there. <laughs> Thanks for warning me. Um, so let's get started. So social business the next decade. Um, first of all, I want to start with this. So this is obviously an old magazine. And you can't really necessarily see it very well, but this was back when, before TV was invented. And people predicted that radio at some point would have images, and, and you see the guy with the little squeezer that was the remote control attached to the TV. You know, over, we always try to predict what's going to happen, right? Uh, cold energy. This might actually happen after SOPA. Uh, pirate radio stations. Now, we might have to have pirate websites operating outside of borders. But we've kind of taken the same approach with social media a little bit and social business now that the vocabulary is changing. And so we, we have this weird kind of you know, shiny new object syndrome of what social media is and how exciting it is. And so you start to like kind of look at the way some of this stuff is presented, some of the way that it's sold, and in turn how some of it is uh, understood or interpreted by decision makers. And you get a lot of this. It's kind of like, oh, we have this new thing. You know, you had the press, then you had uh, newspapers, then you had radio, then you had television, then you had the internet. Now we have all this stuff, and there's not a lot of thought a lot of times being put into what this really means and what it can do for you. It's just kind of, we were doing things in a certain way, now the channels are changing, we're going to do the same thing on these new channels, and we get, we get this problem. So this is where we are. So now, again, that's not me, no crystal balls. Um, so what I want to do is, is start, um, before we talk about what's coming, with what we actually know, with what we can see right now, some trends that, that are developing that are long-term enough that, that we're pretty sure these things are going to go that way. And then what I'll do is I'll tell you what I talk about and what I hear, talking to platform developers, talking to technology companies, and talking to B2B and B2C companies that are trying to connect better um, with customers using these platforms and these technologies. So what do we know? One third of the population is online right now. So we're at about 7 billion people. Um, this chart here, 2006, uh, only, what was it? Um, total population on the internet was 18%. Now it's 35. What's interesting is over the last five years, developing countries, right, so not us, developing countries have increased their share of global internet use from 44 to 62%. So they're one of the fastest growing segments. Do you guys know why? No? Okay, well, we'll I'll tell you in a second. All right, so now this is what's interesting. It starts to tell the story a little bit better. These are all different, th I don't know if you can read it in the back, so I'll, I'll describe the color code. The um, red lines are, uh, fixed broadband subscriptions. So these are fixed broadband, you know, hardwired, basically. Um, the orange line is fixed telephone lines. So the old telephone line that you plug into the wall. The um, black line is mobile broadband subscription, so mobile phones. The green line is internet users, and the blue line is mobile phone subscriptions, so wireless telephone. And what you find is that there are only two of those that are flat. They're not growing at all. They're just staying steady and even dropping a little bit. One is the fixed telephone lines, and the other one is the fixed internet, right? The areas of growth are internet users, mobile broadband, and mobile phone subscriptions. So what we have is we have a, an increasing amount of people in the world getting on the internet, accessing the internet for the first time. We have no growth rate in fixed telephone lines or fixed internet. The only growth is on mobile. Mobile devices, mobile internet. Okay, see the correlation? 
How do people in uh, most developing countries first access the internet? Mobile phones, that's right, not computers. So it's changing the face of business because we're changing the interfaces, and you'll see how that, that becomes a little bit clearer later. Um, here's some, I think you guys are gonna make these available to everybody, right? Yeah. So you can look at these, uh, these slides uh, in more detail after the, the conference. And I have the links in there too, so you can go deeper into that research. Um, but when you start looking at the difference between 2009 and 2014 in terms of penetration of 3G handsets, Western Europe, 2009, 39% penetration. By 2014, 92%. Okay? North America, from 38 to 74% between 2009 and 2014. Eastern Europe, 9% to 40%. Japan gets to 100% by 2014. So you see that growth, more and more people are using cell phones, more and more people are using smartphones, more and more people are using the technologies and the platforms and accessing the internet this way. So the web is increasingly becoming mobile. We know this. And this is going to affect, obviously, what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Because these devices not only allow people to reach or connect to the internet and do things, but they also allow them to do a lot more things than they used to be able to do with a phone and even with just a regular computer. All right, two, tablets are becoming the new computing interface. Um, and I'm gonna show you some figures on, on tablet growth. That's pretty interesting. So um, this is the shipment forecast by device. And um, actually, I'm not sure if this is global or just North America, so I apologize. Um, but the, blue, the dark blue line is desktop PCs. So the, the dark blue is just regular desktop. The light blue is mobile PCs, so laptops. The um, gray line on the outside is smartphones. And the uh, green line is, uh, I'm sorry, the green line is smartphones and the, the gray line is tablets. And you see the tablets started right here, end of 2009, how they're growing. What's important to see is that um, obviously regular desktop computers, no growth, right? Laptops, mobile computers, nice growth. Smartphones, growth. Tablets are actually going to outgrow um, hard desktop computers by 2013. That's pretty significant. So what's happening is the laptops are starting to completely um, uh, replace, I'm sorry, I haven't had my enough coffee today, have started to replace the desktops and the tablets are replacing the laptops. That's what's happening. And that's also affecting the way that things are, are going to change in terms of business and communications. So, so you have this shift. The shift to mobile internet, the shift to more intelligent devices, and the shift to tablets and different interfaces that allow you to do a lot more than just traditional computers. Three, the web is becoming increasingly social, right? Facebook, YouTube, uh, G+, Pinterest, Foursquare, you're all familiar with them. You've seen the numbers, you've seen the growth. Um, eventually, when the Facebooks of the world get to a point where they can't grow anymore, or their growth levels off, new ones will emerge. So I'm not gonna try to guess at who's going to be the next Facebook today? Is it going to be Pinterest? Is it going to be Google Plus? I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Um, what we know is that these platforms will eventually fall off and die, kind of like MySpace, or they will stay steady and something else will come and take its place, or they'll merge. So it's the, the ecosystem isn't going to change that much. The names might change, but these things are here to stay. They, now that we've unlocked this, now that people can be social online, it's not going to go away. You guys, um, are you familiar with what's going on in China right now? With, okay, so the Chinese, uh, unfortunately allowed, unfortunately for them, allowed people to use microblogging platforms there, just like we do here. And uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But now with the Arab Spring, they're a little bit afraid. So they're trying to crack down, and they're, they're trying to, uh, to create a new law where everybody who creates an online profile that any kind of microblogging platform has to prove that they are who they are. They, can be, they don't want any anonymous accounts anymore, so they can track who's doing what. And it's kind of interesting because um, we'll talk about privacy concerns in a minute. And uh, so in countries in, in the West, countries in the US uh, or North America, we don't really have that much of a problem. The, the balance of power is still with the consumer. We can do whatever we want, but a lot of countries with the kind of data that we have and a lot of proliferation of this thing, might try to crack down and actually slow down the development and the adoption of microblogging platforms. And that's gonna be an interesting challenge. But okay, so let's go back to our thing. Sorry about the tangent. So here, the channels are changing. Do you know what these two <laughs> lines are? Can you read them? 
or no, probably not. So the blue line, the one that's going down, is people spending time watching television, live broadcast television. The line going up is people watching the same shows online, YouTube, whatever. So what we see is that sometime in 2019, they actually go backwards. Less people will access content on television, like regular TV shows. More of them will just get it on demand, on their devices, on their computers. It could be on their phone, on their tablets, and their laptops. So that's a significant change in terms of where you're going to spend your marketing dollars, where you're going to be doing your research, where companies are going to interact with consumers. It really changes the entire model. And one thing that, that I want you to bear in mind, and this is something, like really the real reason for this, this whole presentation and why I have this discussion with a lot of CEOs, is that this is coming in, in five, six years. And you can't wait for it to happen to finally like, get on it and try to figure out how it's going to work. If you see what's coming five years down the road, you can start planning now and start changing the way that you do business, start changing the way that your organization is, uh, is structured, start changing the way that marketing interfaces with PR and market research and consumer insights so that you can be ready for this. Um, because if you're not, your competitors will be, and obviously you won't have the advantage that they do. So this is coming, 2019, we have a shift from television to internet. So also another thing that we know is that what people do on the, on the web is changing. It used to be you just you know, search for something, you read something, um, you went to a website and that was it. But now look at all the different things when, when you really think about it. You know, you're gonna follow people, you're gonna share content, you're gonna recommend things, you can make calls on the internet, you can plus one something, you can connect, you can subscribe, you can check in, and you can do a lot of this stuff too. The checkout, adding to cart, checking out, or donating. And that's very important. And that's what fuels the whole thing, right? Ultimately, that's what, this, what matters about all this. So let's talk about mobile commerce. Mobile commerce is growing significantly. So these are US figures. If you want to see global figures, they're about double that. They're, they're about like 85% more than this. So 2010, um, internet commerce, I'm sorry, mobile commerce, $3 billion, worldwide just shy of $6 billion. By 2016, it gets to $31 billion. Okay, more people accessing the internet with their phones, most, more people with phones, more people buying stuff on phones. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what's your company doing to be there right now, right? Or what are you doing to be there in two years or in six months? Because a chunk, a huge chunk of retail, a huge chunk of business is going to be done that way. And if your company isn't planning for this, isn't partnering with companies that will allow you to do this, you're already falling behind. So this is pretty important. Um, this is actually e-commerce, not mobile commerce. So this is commerce on the web, just to show you. Um, so here, this is global. 572 billion in 2010. By next year, it'll almost double. Um, one thing that's interesting, it's not on this, but I think it, it says it right there, uh, or it might be the next one, maybe the next one, I don't know. Um, in 2010, mobile commerce accounted for 1%, just 1% of e-commerce. Already it's 7%. That's how fast it's grown already. So also bear in mind, there's a shift going. More people are buying online, more people are buying with their phones, so it's going to exp exponentially grow. It's a compounded thing. Um, E-retail sales in Europe, here we go. So from 2009, projected to 2015, 2011, 91 billion, 2009, it was 68. By 2015, 103 billion. So again, all that, same idea, be there or think about it. So obviously, because this is changing and consumer behaviors are changing, they're now interfacing with brands in a different way. They're finding out about products, they're sourcing products, searching, and they're actually also purchasing products on the web using mobile devices. Um, the way that you do business is changing, and so some of the new revenue models that companies have been working on are changing. So if a company's been doing business a certain way for 20 years, or 30 years, or 40 years, and suddenly you change the interfaces and you change the consumer behaviors radically in basically four or five years, it's really hard to adapt. And um, who here was for the, the initial um, uh, Fawn's presentation this morning? Okay, most of you take it. So he taught, you, you heard that he talked about like the difficulty internally of companies, people trying to figure out how to work together, and, and one of the big hurdles isn't actually social media adoption or understanding this stuff, it's getting all the pieces to work together, right? It's just cultural. Um, it's very difficult when technologies change this quickly, and when it's so easy for consumers 
to adopt new things and just basically download an app. And within five minutes, you're pretty much an expert. You know how to use it because you're playing with it. And now you're buying stuff online. It takes you five or 10 minutes. It takes a company three years because of that. So the, the sooner you start and the more you, you, the clearer you see the picture, the more you can adapt. So obviously, with these revenue models, same thing. You have to think about the way that consumers behave and interact with your companies through these devices. Subscriptions, check-ins, recommendations, watching stuff, downloading stuff, checking out, and obviously spending money. So um, the first thing I want to talk to you, so that was the end of kind of like where we've come, kind of where we're going uh, based on data, based on things that we actually know, unless some giant catastrophe happens, an asteroid hits the Earth, this is pretty much what's going on. So who here has heard, show of hands, of solo mode? Good, that's not bad. All right, usually it's crickets, nobody. Like one guy will point his finger out because he doesn't want to feel stupid, but no, okay. So solo mode is social, local, mobile. So this is one of the big evolutions uh, that we're going to see in, uh, in the way that, that social and mobile together are going to change the way that businesses um, operate. And the, the choice is entirely yours, right? Depending on, on whether, by the way, who here works for an agency or a marketing firm? Okay, who here works for a company that, that sells stuff, that makes stuff? Okay, all right, so good half and half kind of. Um, so this is gonna be important. You can either keep doing business the way that you were, or you can start focusing on this because you can. So for example, let me show you something. Who here is familiar with social CRM, or the concept of social CRM? Who here is, keep your hands up. Who here is just uh, not social CRM, just regular CRM? Keep your hands up. If, okay, so. There's more people here who know about CRM than social CRM. Basically what social CRM is regular CRM plus all the social data. And hopefully you can combine the two and, and we can be able to combine better and better. So here's kind of you know, what we know from, from all these platforms. So you, know, you look at Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, G+. You know who your consumer's friends are, right? You can find that out. LinkedIn's another one too. You know what they like because they click like. So they tell you, and they also talk about stuff. So if they man mention certain things and they mention them in a positive way when you do sentiment analysis, you can find out and you can start doing like you know, consumer profiling, right? Who are their friends? What do they like? What do they like to talk about? You know, what are things that are interesting to them? Is it you know, chihuahua bathing? Is it politics? Is it sports? Whatever. Um, you know generally where they live. You might, know their you might not know their exact address, but from their profile, you know that they live in Amsterdam or Paris or New York. Um, if, you, if you pay attention to Get Glue or YouTube and you look at their, uh, their, their accounts there, you kind of know what they watch and you know what they listen to. So you know what kind of movies they're into, you know what kind of music they like, uh, or what they experiment with. So already that's you know, download behaviors, consumer, uh, consumption behaviors. You know some of the things that, that they're already like, prone to buy or prone to be interested in. Categories, styles, etc. You can also look at frequency of purchases. You can look at frequency of downloads and see people spend a lot of time downloading music as opposed to no time at all. They just rather talk about politics. Depending on what kind of business you're in, it's pretty important. If you look at Foursquare, Gowalla, uh, G+, whatever, you know where they go, you know where they shop, and you know who they shop with, right? That's all really important data, okay? So um, the, thing about, the thing about one of the, the, the real huge advantages of social is that it gathers a lot of data on consumers. And right now, the discussion that we keep having about it is, is personal intrusion, right? It's, it's privacy rights. Um, Pinterest just got in trouble uh, for, I think, allegedly, um, without telling its users, accessing their contact lists, right? In the background. Yeah. And path too, right? Yeah. Um, so um, that's, it's a little bit of a problem. It turns people off. Constantly, Facebook runs into the same kinds of problems, right? Um, where it's every time there's a change, people don't want their stuff to be on the internet, there's privacy concerns. Um, so one of the issues, and, and I'll bring this up again, is that it's very important as companies start to use these platforms to gather data, to collect data, that they're, they have to be, I don't want to use the word transparent because it's such a buzzword now, but they have to be really honest about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And there's actually a way to do it that doesn't turn people off and that will make people want to go ahead and give data without really worrying or having to worry about the, uh, 
the privacy stuff. But okay, we'll talk, we'll come back to that. So what's going on now is is basically this, right? So most people look at all these platforms as fun. You get to share stuff, you get to play games, you get to post pictures, interact with your friends. It's a lot of fun. What's really happening is these platforms are collecting data. So if you were to kind of you know pull the curtain back on this, you would see um, that this say this is Google or Facebook, right? This is us, and there's somebody behind the curtain. Every time we say something, they're gathering that data and compartmentalizing it somewhere, right? They're just basically taking all that data. It's a giant data funnel. It's constantly gathering data on you and analyzing it and building a profile eventually for future use, and it's getting better and better at it. Um, so again, you'll hold that thought. We'll come back to that. So what brands are focusing on now, though, is not so much that. Right now, brands, so I use Starbucks in this instance, but it's not really Starbucks, okay? It's just you know, easy to use that. Um, you look at all these platforms, and what are these brands doing? They're focusing on marketing, they're focusing on advertising, engagement, special offers, discounts, uh, you know, likes, accumulating shares, accumulating customers. It's all marketing, right? It's kind of like, oh, all these channels are here now, like television and radio. Let's put a bunch of stuff on there and see if people like kind of respond to it in some way by clicking a button, by sharing something, right? It's very limited. Um, okay, we're back to that. You have to dive deeper. And the opportunity, now that, that the data is becoming better, now that we're moving forward, and what's going to happen in the next 10 years, is instead of just accumulating shares and likes and, and pushing content constantly at people like we used to with other channels, is you can dive deeper into the data. And you can do this in partnership with these platforms, or you can do it yourself on the back end by looking at some of the things that, that you can actually kind of pull from your reporting and from your dashboards and start creating your own social CRM systems, or at least databases. So now it's not just you know, marketing, advertising, and engagement and trying to push stuff out. It's actually asking questions. Who are my customers? Who aren't my customers? Who are my customers who interact with us on these platforms? Who are the people who are not our co customers yet, but who interact with us on our platforms anyway? And why aren't they customers if they're interacting with us? How often do they use our product? Um, you know, who are their friends? Where do they go? What do they like, right? Okay, these are all important things if you're a business. Five years ago, you couldn't do that. Now you can actually start asking these questions. And these questions are gonna be really important in terms of targeting. And again, we'll see why that's important um, in a minute. But the problem with this model, which is what most companies do now, what they focus on, is all that's really driving is this. Oh, fun, I get to spend my budget here now. So all companies are doing really is shifting their budgets or growing their budgets in marketing and PR from traditional media to social or kind of creating a hybrid. They're not changing the way they really do business, right? Having a blog is not having a social media program. It's not being a social company. Pushing stuff on Facebook is not being social. It's just having the community managers who pushes content and has conversations every once in a while just because you want to have a presence there. It's not really doing anything, though. What's happening, though, is these guys are the only real winners. Hey, just keep buying ads. Keep buying stuff from us. The companies aren't really getting full advantage. Once they start doing this, and the companies that are already doing this are already starting to reap their rewards. And the reason why is because when you know what the friends are, you know what more things about your customers, you understand them better, you can start targeting them better. And the whole notion of social CRM is being able to take what you already know from your CRM system, from your customer relationship management system, looking at accounts, especially if you're in the B2B world, and you look at your clients and your customers and you know what they're buying and how often and how. Um, or if you have loyalty reward programs and people use their cards or a code or something to buy stuff. Um, and then you can take the social stuff and bring it together and create a very clear picture and data sets of what consumers' behaviors are. So you know when to target them properly, with what kind of message, on what channel, at the right time, in the right way, et cetera. And you can find out, you can actually look to see if they're changing your behaviors. So the idea is to target customers better. Um, otherwise, you're spending a lot of money reaching 4% of the people that you've actually touched, right? What's the, the main unit of measure for marketing and PR? Impressions. How many people have seen your stuff? I'm sorry, can I curse? Is that all right? <laughs> Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit how many people saw your stuff? How many people were actually influenced by it is, is more important, right? If a million people saw your ad 
and only three people bought your product, what are impressions matter? All it's telling you is that you had no conversions. People saw it and they didn't care. What really matters is changing customer behaviors, changing consumer behaviors. Not only acquiring new customers, that's one thing, but taking customers you already have who might only buy your product once a month to buy it twice a month, right? Or customers you already have who are buying the green product to buy the blue product now also, right? Changing consumer behavior. So by targeting them better, you can spend your marketing dollars better. So here you don't have to waste money basically throwing a bunch of money at a wall and seeing what sticks. The other thing is you can increase ROI by doing this. And I don't want to get into an ROI discussion, but if, if you spent the same amount of money marketing to a bunch of strangers or the same amount of money marketing to people that you know might be interested, where do you think you're going to get a better return? Second one, right? So the more you know about your customers, obviously, the, more you, the better you can spend your money and the more effective your marketing will be. And the third thing is, and this is important, and this is what we were kind of alluding to earlier, you have to do it in a way that's not intrusive. You have to do it in a way that, that doesn't infringe on people's sense of personal privacy and space, right? You can't um, betray the trust that you've established in these social channels the way that you do with normal marketing channels. It's perfectly acceptable for us to be driving down the road, listening to the radio and hear an ad come on, right? You know you have five, six ads coming up between shows, or you look up and there's a, da a, a, a board with an advertising on it. We're used to that. But if you're having a conversation with somebody on Twitter or on Facebook and suddenly you know, an ad comes out of that conversation because that person accepted you know, to sponsor an ad, it's like, wait a minute, what's going on? And it's, it's off-putting and it actually has, has a negative effect. So there's a way to do this if you know that consumers are interested in your type of product to do it so it's not intrusive. All right, so real-time, real-world targeting. This is pretty exciting and there, there are quite a few um, startups, actually platform developers, building this out now. So this isn't science fiction, this is stuff that already exists. It hasn't really scaled yet. But if I were a retailer, <laughs> I would use this tomorrow if I could. So here's Dave. So we'll come back to Dave in a second. Would you like to know where you target customers, right? Would you? Do you like to know where they are right now? Maybe? Okay. Um, well, there's Dave. So we know he's here because one, he might have checked in somewhere with Foursquare, or he might have opted into a new platform that basically kind of follows him around. And you know that with the, iPhone, the new iPhones, basically it keeps track of where you are at all times. So it's, it's very easy to do. So say you wanted to opt in to a model that, that says, okay, today I want to be on, I want to be able to uh, broadcast my location to advertisers. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm bored, I want to shop, I, and we'll see why that works in a second. There's actually an incentive to doing that. But you could figure out where he is. You could also, right now, figure out where he's been and where he likes to go. This could be Dave's profile of the most popular places he visits any given month. So he might go to other places, but these are the places he visits on a regular basis. And you can drill down and find out what these are. It could be the grocery store, it could be his place of work, it could be the dog park, it could be a movie theater, it could be the sex shop, it doesn't matter. It's good to know that stuff, but you can actually find this out. Um, you can also find out where they're going, not just where they are. So your cell phone is equipped with a system that not only tells people where you are, but kind of, you know, in which direction you're going. So imagine a dashboard where people who've signed up uh, or opted into that model are in there, and you can actually see within a city where they're going, which direction they're taking. Why would you want that? Well, say you're at Starbucks or any kind of retailer, and you have stores all over the city, and people have opted into... Uh, I don't know, maybe a, a rewards program, and they've turned on their phone, now you know where they're, how close they are. And again, if they've opted in, if they've allowed you to do this, uh, by the way, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, uh, it can come in pretty handy because you can prompt them to actually come to your store. So I know this sounds a lot like this, right? I mean, that's the reaction that you have, like, okay, wait a minute. All these advertisers, any company, not just the government, but a company, can figure out exactly where I am. They can tell that I'm sitting on the toilet right now, facing north. <laughs> Don't take your phone to the toilet. Um, so what I want you to think about though, and this is very possible, right? So you have to, as consumers and as marketers and, and professionals, it's, it's really all of our job to make sure that it doesn't turn into this. So we have to be careful. 
Um, but you have to think, do I still have time? Speed it up a little bit. Coffee for you there. Oh, thank. Oh, yeah. Okay. So How much time do I have? Well, uh, mine is uh, two minutes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Seriously? Okay. Take, take five more, and then we'll okay. have some questions. Yeah, that was fast. Okay. So think about it as big mother, not big brother. Okay. Very important. And somebody should actually use this as their company name for this stuff. So big brother focuses on what you're doing, and follows you around. Big mother actually is is using all this information to make your life better. So um, you know. Big Mother knows how far you are from your favorite coffee shop, for example, or that, you've pro that you're probably in the mood for pizza because it's already done some analysis with social CRM that tells that basically on a Tuesday at noon, you usually, you're usually 80% more uh, prone to order pizza than anything else. That's information that you can sell or push out in real time to all the pizza retailers in the area where you are, and they can opt to like reach out to you, send you an ad, whatever. So these are things that actually, you know, that H&M that down the street has 20% off, or that there's a pharmacy down the road. And your refrigerator, which is keeping track of, of some of your products inside your kitchen, might tell you that, hey, you need aspirin today. And there's a, there's a pharmacy two, uh, two streets down. So Big Mother knows what she knows because of customer transaction history, uh, customer transaction habits, social stuff. So back to our example, you can have um, Starbucks basically reach out if you've opted into the system to a consumer, say, hey, it's time for coffee. There's, you know, here we are, right? Just follow the map, we'll meet you there. Then the, cons the customer might be able to look at his own map and see, oh, I have a friend nearby. Let me go ahead and ping her, see if she wants to have coffee with me. So now, you know, she can say yes, she can say no. What happens is if you do this right, and you can be just really obnoxious about it, but if you do this right as a retailer, you might have created more sales and more goodwill towards your, your product than you would have if you weren't doing this. The alternative is this, buy our stuff, push marketing out. I wish I had more time, crap. Mm. Dang it. Okay, so two more things. Uh, you know what, we'll skip customer service. The idea with customer service is pay attention, monitor it, right? And don't wait for the toll-free number. The stuff that you're starting to see now with, custo with customer service programs listening for mentions, negative mentions, uh, inquiries, and negative mentions online, is that if I'm somewhere, if I'm at Starbucks and I say, this sucks, I'm having a terrible experience, and I'm Facebooking this or, or tweeting it, somebody at Starbucks should reach out to me almost immediately and say, whoa, wait a minute, what happened? Let's fix this. So where we are today is you're starting to see that happening. Right? It might be 20 minutes later and it might be too late. But you're going to have somebody from the company who's paying attention reach out to you and say, hey, you know, how can we fix that? But then there's not really a mechanism for them to call the, the store, talk to the manager, get them to fix it in real time and, and, and develop that. that. Those pieces are getting connected now. Where it's not just going to be a customer service person saying, we're sorry, you know, <laughs> hopefully come back. Um, they'll be able to reach out immediately to operations and say, there's somebody in your store, this is what they look like. They just ordered the coffee, you gave them something bad, go right now and just apologize and fix it. And that'll be very quick. So customer service is radically going to change because of this data. Why? Because it costs six times more to actually acquire a new customer than it is to retain one. So most of the money right now in social media is being used to acquire customers, right? You're acquiring fans, you're acquiring likes, shares, etc. Everybody's trying to like acquire new customers. Okay, that's nice, but screw it. At some point, you're not going to acquire more customers. Don't lose customers. That's more important. Take the customers that you already have, that you've already spent $65 acquiring, and spend $10 in customer service making sure they don't go away. That's it. Plus, they'll do all, the, uh, all your advertising for you because they'll recommend you to their friends. So you know, don't throw money away. Um, and then the last thing I want to bring up since I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Um, you guys familiar with this? Yeah. Think about what Siri could do five years from now. Siri connected to, um, to the cloud. Siri connected to social CRM. Siri connected to your profile, knowing everything that you do. Siri becomes, whoops. I must have taken that slide out. Siri becomes big mother, essentially. That is the interface. What you're seeing on your iPhones or the iPhone 4S right now is really a very basic, locked up prototype of, of what Big Mother really ends up being. It's your personal assistant. It's a personal assistant in the cloud that knows you so well that whether you opt into programs or not, whether you decide to increase 
the amount of openness that you want to have to marketing messages or decrease it, right? You could turn it off with the volume button. Like, I don't want to be bothered today. I just want to do my stuff. You turn it down. You want to be open to offers because it's Saturday and you're shopping and everywhere you go, you want to find out if there's coupons, you turn the volume up. And then all the retailers that they already know you might be interested in when you're within proximity can sell to you, okay? Make sense? Okay, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. But if you have questions, I'm here all afternoon, so please feel free to ask me questions. I think we have time maybe for a few yeah? questions from, okay. uh, from the room. Thank you first for your, uh, for your presentation. We I knew it was going to be too long, yeah, right? I told you so. We spoke about this uh, yesterday. I reviewed Olivier's uh, presentation. I failed. Uh, and he said, Stop. I have, uh, what was it, 80 or 70 slides? Yeah. Yeah, and I said, okay, you have to really speed it up. And he said, yeah, I'll make sure I'll do that. It was JP's introduction. It was too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's blame JP. Yep. Uh, does anybody have a question for Olivier? Is everybody very hungry or? Okay. Uh, JP, has a JP has one question. I also have one. Yeah. Uh, if you say that television is gonna, or um, that internet is taking over television, or at least traditional television, what do you think uh, a TV show um, would look like in 2016? Well, um, first of all, there's. Oh, wait. You guys like. Can you get me back on real quick? There we go. Okay. So that's that's one of the things that's coming, and that's it's a really good question. The um, the, a lot of, okay, the integration of digital media is, is also coming. And what it is is televisions are becoming more social. So the way that you interact with television shows, not necessarily choosing an ending, although there's some experimentation with that, um, but blending the social experience of watching TV shows, signing into them, talking with them, is, is going to change. So there's not going to be a huge difference, really, between watching a TV show on uh, uh, one of your devices or watching television uh, or watching the show on television. But what's interesting though is with all of this is your fridge is gonna be able to tell with RFID technology what is in there. Um, the ads on TV might actually be able to, based on your profile, talk to your fridge. Your fridge will generate uh, uh, potential coupons and shopping lists for you that will then be transferred to the interface in your car and your devices. So that when you're watching TV, you can actually share or tag an ad or tag a product that you see somebody wearing or somebody eating or a restaurant where they are and actually go ahead and include it in your profile that will then be shared through all these devices. So, I mean, I know it sounds a little bit weird, but the interactive aspect of this, being able to essentially kind of grab things off of a TV show, off of an ad, off of a website, and adding it to your purchasing profile um, and, and that being carried through all your devices is one thing that's, that's going to change. Um, not in the next two years, but definitely by 2020, you'll see a lot more of that. And I mean, it makes sense because if you're selling products, product placement literally becomes like advertising that you can click on and take with you anywhere you go. So. Okay, Olivier, quick yep. one. Oh, we're sitting here myself. I'm here. Um, I've been noticing the tweets and we've been talking about yep. privacy and so on yesterday. And many people are saying like, oh, big mother is like big mother-in-law and you know, <laughs> we're going to define the privacy ourselves within yes. a few years. And we talked about it. I know it's in your slides. And can you quickly resume how you see that, the opt-in, opt-out, and right. all the other shit? I, I think, first of all, the, the, the <laughs> yes, all the other shit. So the, uh, the, the basis for that, the foundations for all this to happen are going to be with legislation right off the bat. Consumer protection is going to become a, uh, a, a much bigger issue. Consumer <laughs> privacy is going to be a, be a bigger issue. I think that you'll see more politicians running with these types of, of topics on their platforms. Uh, we saw the fight in the United States with SOPA, uh, which really galvanized a lot of people. So it's becoming a hot button issue. So I think already um, there are going to, every country is going to have laws or every zone is going to have laws that kind of regulate what companies can and cannot do, okay, first of all. Second, I think companies obviously are going to have to get smarter about this. Um, the thing with PATH, kind of accessing information without telling people, really turned people off and it was a very negative hit on that company's reputation. Um, you don't want to do stuff like that. People are always worried about it. So the more transparent a company is about this stuff, and I think the more... The, the better they explain to consumers that, look, we're getting this data. We're going to make money off your data, right? We're going to sell it to advertisers. But we want to be able to give you the power to control who reaches you and who doesn't. We want you to help us make it better. And you can already look at Facebook 
all the ads that pop up on the right side of the screen, you can turn them off. And then a little thing will pop up saying what? Was it you know, misleading? Are you not interested in it? Is it repetitive? Help us kind of target you better. Um, once you start explaining to people, okay, all we want to do is not push bad marketing on you or things you're not interested in, but things that you are interested in, and more importantly, that you're interested in right now, before you even know it, because we, we know you so well. Um, that's what we want to get to. Once you do that and you let people, first of all, understand it and to have control over it, then you're good. And I, I think the, the bar, the, the volume button, is really easy. It's a very e easy interface for any kind of cell phone, for any kind of device. You can choose completely. I, want to be, I don't want to be bothered by marketers right now, or I want to be bothered by a lot of marketers, or I want to be bothered by only the marketers that I've selected to, in, to interrupt my day right now because they're on my list of 10. Does that make sense, JP? So, so very important, that volume button, um, to allow people to control when and how they're, they're being interrupted by marketing messages or offers or just you know, friendly hello tweets from Starbucks. Can you talk about data? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can talk about this stuff for days. <laughs> we can. We, we did yesterday. It was a lot of fun. Um, so if you have any more questions for Olivier, he's uh, also going to participate in the social talk uh, about ROI, which is led by uh, JP. Um, and he's going to have lunch now, so tackle him uh, if you would like to. Yeah, tackle me all you want. And uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for your presentation. Oh, it was very really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. The lunch break is until 2. <laughs> I thought I was I thought I was doing fine all the time. I have no idea.